Lord, we know that we are in need of you. We know that we need you to work right now. Lord, we confess our need for the Holy Spirit. I confess my need for you, Lord. We want you to be present because when you are present, hearts are changed. When you are present, lives are renewed. It's by your power that we seek your change and your restoration and your renewal. This time is yours. We give it completely, fully, totally to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It was a dark, stormy night in the German summer of 1521, and a law student was riding on his way back to his university. The horse's hoofs splashed through puddles, making circles in the mud. Rain poured down, drenching his clothing. Thunder rumbled, lightning cracked, but he urged his animal on. The law student had recently completed a master's degree at Erfurt University, and now he was returning for further studies. He was determined to make it to his university without stopping, but his journey would be loudly interrupted. As he plodded along through the darkness, he was about uh, three hours away from his university when suddenly there was a blinding flash and a deafening crack as a bolt of lightning struck the ground just next to the rider. The shock wave from the bolt of lightning sent him flying off his horse and terrified in the darkness as he fell through the rain, thinking he would die, he called out to heaven, help me, Saint Anne. I will become a monk. And perhaps heaven did help him because he fell to the ground without harm and he picked himself up and he got back on his horse and finished his journey. But a few days after he returned to the university, he dropped out of his program, left the school and kept his word to heaven, began a new religious life as a monk. That student's name was Martin Luther. He was destined to strike the church like lightning and change it forever. The time for reformation had come. Welcome back to Truth Lutheran Church English Ministry. As many of you probably know, this Tuesday marks the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years ago, in 1517, a wild-eyed reformer named Martin Luther pounded 95 theses onto the door of a church in Wittenberg, 95 points of disagreement with the Catholic Church. That action of protest has come to signify the beginning of the Protestant Church, virtually all non-Catholic churches, and it's come to symbolize the beginning of a radical change in the church called the Protestant Reformation. And it's about reformation, church reformation, that I would like to talk to you today. What is reformation? Unfortunately, the definition of reformation is fairly unhelpful. The action or process of reforming an institution. Okay, thank you very much. Reformation means reshaping. It means reforming something that has gone off course. A reformation is a reset for something that has gone wrong. A reformation is a reset for something that has gone wrong. The sad truth about human institutions is that almost all human institutions end up going wrong. People begin these institutions with pure motives and with excitement and maybe they function well for a while, but over time, those institutions go wrong. Every human institution that is not carefully guarded will end up somehow changing into something it wasn't intended to be, changing into something different, devolving into something else. You know what I'm talking about. This is like when social clubs over the years end up becoming gangs. This is when fraternities end up becoming more like cults. This is when democracies become dictatorships and when nations become empires. Every human institution, every institution made up of human beings, if it's not carefully guarded, will go astray and become something else 
even the church. Every now and then, the church slips and it changes and it becomes something it's not supposed to be. And when that happens, it's time for a reset. When Martin Luther looked at the Catholic Church in the 1500s, he saw that the church had changed and it had shifted, that the Catholic Church had warped into something that it wasn't supposed to be. He looked at the church and saw that it was time for a reset, that it was time for a change. He didn't want to be a reformer. But faithfulness to God meant at that time there had to be a difference. There had to be a shift. So he led through this crazy process he led a reset for the church called the Reformation. Now it has been 500 long, aging years since the Reformation of Martin Luther. How is the Protestant church in America doing? Every institution that is not carefully guarded over time eventually goes astray. When is it time for Reformation? When's it time for a reset? This morning, as we think about the Reformation, as we ponder upon the amazing reformer Martin Luther, this is the question I want you to consider. When is it time for a church reset? How do you know when the church has kind of stopped becoming who it's meant to be? What, what indicates a change that needs to happen? What are, those, what are some of those fundamentals that we have to have? When is it time for a reset? The big question Oh, sorry, go back. The big question is, when is it time for a reset? When's it time for a church reset? And we're going to answer that question by first opening your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 22. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 22. And as you turn there, listen, I'm going to break down a little bit what we're going to do today. This morning we're going to look at three different groups, three groups that were in need of reformation. First, we're going to look at Judah in the Old Testament as they needed change, they needed reformation. We're going to look at the Catholic Church in the 1500s that needed change and reformation. Then we're going to draw a few texts from the churches in Revelation, these unfaithful churches that Christ speaks to. Okay, you're tracking with me? So three groups that we're going to look at that needed Reformation. Three groups that needed Reformation. Old Testament, Catholic Church, Revelation churches. And we're going to find three signs that reveal it's time for reset. Three signs that kind of show you something's gone wrong. Church has lost its identity. It's time for a reset. Let's pray over our text before we dive. Lord, we pray for your word to come into our hearts. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illumine the understanding of our hearts to know your word, to know who the church is supposed to be, and to understand when it's time for a reset in your church. Thank you that you're faithful to teach us the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 640 BC, a boy named Josiah became the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Josiah's father, Ammon, had just been assassinated, so the heavy crown fell to Josiah. He was only eight years old when he became king. Originally, the kingships, the monarchies of Israel, were going well with kings like David and Solomon, who led Israel to be the nation that she was called to. But after David and Solomon, lesser kings followed them. And these, many of these kings led the country astray. Most recently to Josiah's kingship, Josiah's father and grandfather, Ammon and Manasseh, had led Israel away from her identity. Ammon and Manasseh put no value on the word of God. They betrayed and abandoned God's word. They forsook God's word and led Judah away from God's word. And as Judah let, walked away from God's word, she changed into something else. So when this young boy Josiah took the throne, he knew very little about God. Josiah wanted to honor the Lord, but he didn't really know how to do that because Josiah, the king, didn't even have a book of the law. He didn't even have God's word. 
But he did what he thought would honor the Lord, what he thought was best. He hired some workers to repair Solomon's temple. The temple of the Lord was in disrepair. It was falling apart, maybe kind of like our current building. The temple was falling apart. It was in disrepair. And so Josiah hired these workers to come and repair the temple. In 1 Kings 22, verse 3, Josiah sends his secretary, whose name is Shaphan, to go to the temple and to collect some money and pay the workers who are working on the temple. And in 2 Kings 22, beginning with verse 8, Shaphan goes to the temple, and the high priest Hilkiah has made an amazing discovery. 2 Kings chapter 22, beginning with verse 8. Follow along with me as I read, please. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave Shaphan the book, and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hands of the workmen who have oversight over the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read the book before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes and he commands his servants in verse 13, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah, considering the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that was written concerning us. In the kingdom of Judah in the days of Josiah, the people of Judah had lost their priority on the word of God. They had lost their priority on the word of God. They had so devalued the word of God that they had actually literally lost it. The book of the law had been lost. It was sitting somewhere back in the temple for who knows how many years until this priest Hilkiah found it. The book of the law told Judah who they were. It told Judah how to live. Everything about Judah was contained in the book of the law. How could they have lost it? And yet they lost the authority and the priority of, word of, of the word of God, so they physically lost it. You can't be the people of God without a high priority on the word of God, without the utmost priority on the word of God. And Judah's loss of priority on the word of God revealed that it was time for a reset. The same was true in Martin Luther's day. Martin Luther survived his near-death experience of the lightning strike, and he entered into a monastery to become a monk. But he was, always had this crazy fear of God's judgment. He was really afraid of God's judgment. And the Catholic Church at that time taught that salvation was by works. That it, it, you had to be good enough to get to heaven. And they said, most people wouldn't be good enough. They would have to go to a place called purgatory and suffer for a while before they got into heaven. So Martin Luther was terrified in fearful dread of God's punishment. So he would punish himself, physically exposing himself to the cold, whipping himself, hoping that maybe through his efforts, he might be able to earn a spot in heaven. And he lived in this dread and this fear of God's punishment until one day he was studying God's word and he came across Romans 1.17. This last clause in Romans 1.17 which says, the just shall live by faith. As the word of God sank into Luther's fearful heart, he realized that salvation was not by works. But salvation was by faith. This was a radical concept, and Luther started to study and cross-reference and make sure he was understanding cor correctly until he came to the conclusion that indeed salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works. The Catholic Church had been teaching Luther 
a lie about salvation his entire life. Somehow in the process of change over those years, the Catholic Church had lowered the priority of the Word of God and they had put doctrines of man above the authority of God's Word and salvation was not the only place. The Catholic Church, as I told you, talk, taught about this place of purgatory, a spiritual place in between heaven and hell that most believers would go to and they would have to work off their sins. One day Luther was walking through the town of Wittenberg, Germany, and he found this Catholic fundraiser who was raising money to build a church in Rome. And the fundraiser had these sheets of paper, these certificates called indulgences. And the indulgences had the authority of the Pope. And the Catholic fundraiser said that if you bought one of these indulgences, it would reduce your time in purgatory. This was the last straw for Luther. And he responded in outrage. And it was at that point that he nailed those 95 theses on the door of the church, 95 points of disagreement with the church. Purgatory? Indulgences? Where were these doctrines coming from? Where was the church getting this? It certainly wasn't from the word of God. Luther realized in his day that the church had lost the priority of the Word of God, that some other ideas, some other doctrines had come in, infiltrated, taken over the teaching doctrine of the church. And the church became something other than what it was supposed to be. When is it time for a church reset? When is it time for a church reset? The first sign that it's time for a church reset the first sign that it's time for a church reset is when the church has lost the priority of God's Word. When some other authority, when some other teachings come in and take over, the church has lost the priority of God's Word and they've become something different from who Christ has called them to be. The first sign that the church needs a reset is when they've lost the priority of God's Word. Back to Judah. King Josiah heard the word of the law read to him by his secretary, Shaphan. And he was horrified. He was disturbed and distraught. He tore his clothing. He took the judgments that were spoken of in the law literally. Imagine that. He took the judgments of the law literally. And he was horrified by what the scripture said because he knew that Judah had not only lost their priority on the word of God, but Judah had also lost the works of God. Long ago, Judah had stopped walking in the ways of the Lord. They had exchanged the works of God for the works of the flesh. And instead of worshiping the Lord, they were worshiping false gods like Baal and Asherah. Instead of being sexually pure, they were sleeping around. Instead of having a heart for peace, their hearts were filled with violence. And they look just like all the other nations. In 2 Kings chapter 23, the chapter is a detailed account of how King Josiah systematically purged the entire country of any mark, every piece of idolatry, until all idolatry was gone. Judah had lost the distinguishing works of God that set them apart from everyone else. They weren't flourishing in God's work. They were flourishing in sin. And when the people around them saw them, they looked just like the other nations. They lost the distinguishing works of God. And the same was true of much of the Catholic Church in the 1500s. After Luther had become a monk, his superiors sent him on a pilgrimage to Rome. They thought maybe going to Rome would kind of straighten him out and get rid of all these worries and fears that he had. So Luther walked 700 miles south to the city of Rome. He made this crazy journey all the way to Rome. But what he found in Rome disturbed him. In Rome, Luther felt like he saw the greed of the church more clearly than he'd ever seen before. Rome was filled with all these holy objects called relics. They were like shrouds and pieces of bones and crosses and so forth. Um, and every relic had a cost. 
So these people would come from all over Europe, much of them very poor people, peasants, and they would come from thousands of miles and they would pay money to see or touch or kiss these relics and all of the money went to the church. As Luther walked through this incredible city of Rome, he saw the Pope and bishops and cardinals living like kings while poor peasants paid their last farthings to touch a decrepit relic. Luther saw the buildings of the Vatican adorned with gold and silver and marble and all these amazed peasants who could barely feed their families. There was a greed in the church. There was a love for power. There was a love for authority. In Luther's 95 Theses, he asked, why does the church, who is, why does the Pope, who is one of the richest men in all the world, build the church in Rome off of the money of the poor instead of from his own money. Luther was outraged as he saw this church that loved something different from the works of God, that were not flourishing in the distinguishing works of God, but looked like foreign rulers and foreign emperors, just like everybody else. You cannot be the church. You can't be who Christ has called you to be when you stop flourishing in the distinctive works of God the works of righteousness. When does the church need a reset? When does the church need a reset? The first sign that the church needs a reset is when it has lost the word of God. And the second sign that the church needs a reset, the second sign that the church needs a reset. Alex, we go to the next slide for me. The second sign is that when the church has lost the works of God, when the church has stopped living and flourishing in these distinctive works of God, the church needs a reset. The church needs to change. In the book of Revelation, Jesus writes to seven churches, two of which are largely unfaithful. And the Lord speaks to the church in Sardis in Revelation 3, verse 2. He says, For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus and he says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. When the church loses the priority of the word, when they lose the works of God, they become something else. And the, th and the third sign, the third sign that the church is in need of a reset comes still in the book of Revelation in the letter to Ephesus. There were still good things going on in the Catholic Church. There were still good priests and there were good friars and there were good men and women involved in the church. And yet as a whole, the church had lost the works of God. Jesus writes to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And Jesus sees that there are good things in the church. No matter how far the church goes astray, it's always a mix of good and bad. Jesus looks at the church in Ephesus and he says in Revelation 2, 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Jesus is saying, I see that there are good things in you. I see that there are good things in the church. And yet, the church in Ephesus was so far astray from God. In Revelation 2, 4, Jesus says this of the church, But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. You have abandoned your first love. The church in Ephesus had lost its heart for the Lord. Being the church means that we love God first and foremost above everything else. We love Jesus Christ first and foremost. He is our life. Nothing gets in the way of our love for him. But the church in Ephesus had a change of heart, and Judah had a change of heart. Judah didn't love the Lord. Judah loved Baal and Asherah first. They loved sex and pleasure and wealth and comfort first. They had lost their heart for the Lord. Only King Josiah was the exception. King Josiah was an exception to the rule. In 2 Kings 23 verse 25, it says about King Josiah, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of the Lord. Judah had lost its heart for the Lord. 
but a reformer, a resetter, remains faithful with all of their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same was true of that Catholic church in Luther's day. So many of those leaders, so many of those popes and bishops had lost their first heart for Jesus Christ. They loved authority and power and wealth. Pope Leo didn't seem to love his people. He loved golden coins and great buildings. There had been a change in the heart of the church. The church is Christ's bride. How could we love something else first? How could we make Christ a secondary love? When Christ becomes a secondary love in the church, the church has lost its way. And the church needs a reset. What are the signs that the church needs a, research, a reset? When it's lost its heart for Jesus Christ, the church needs a reset. When the church has lost the priority of the Word of God, when the church has largely lost the works of God, and when the church has lost its heart for Jesus Christ, the church needs a reset. This is what it looks like when the church goes astray. In many places, in many times throughout history, this is what it looks like when the church goes astray. When they lose the priority of the word, when they stop flourishing in the works, and when they lose their whole heart for Jesus Christ. We can summarize these three points with the word devotion. Devotion, that disciplined love. When the church loses its devotion for Jesus Christ, the church needs a reset. This is our big idea. One more slide. This is our big idea. When the church loses its devotion, when the church has lost its devotion for Jesus Christ, it's time for a reset. It's time for a reset. When the church has lost its devotion to Jesus Christ, we need reform. Is it time for a reset? Is it time for a reset in the Protestant church in America? Are we prioritizing the Word of God? Are we keeping the Word of God where it's supposed to be in our lives? Many Protestant churches don't even open the Word of God in a church service. You go to a church service and they won't read one text from the Word of God. A friend was just telling me about a service he was in where the pastor preached the whole message about lessons learned from the game of golf. 65% of Protestant Christians don't read their Bible more than maybe two times a week, including church. More than 80% of Protestant Christians don't read the Bible daily. We have the word, but we're not digging into it. We're not reading it, right? There are these huge denominations in the Protestant church which, which are literally dismissing clear teachings of Scripture. Like the sin of homosexuality, like premarital intercourse. They're just dismissing these huge, clear teachings in the Word of God. Because some kind of other authority, some kind of doctrine of man has come up over the authority of the Word of God. And sadly and ironically, churches that Luther has founded have become just like the church that Luther left because a different authority has trumped the Word of God. We're not prioritizing the Scripture. We're dismissing the Scripture. We're ignoring the Scripture. Are we flourishing in the works of God? We already know that 80% of evangelicals don't read their Bible every day. Another, before Jesus left, the last thing that he said was, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But 80% of Protestant Christians never share the gospel. 95% of Protestant Christians will never lead someone to the Lord. There's a 2016 study by the Barna Group of Protestant American Christians. And 72% of America uh, considers themselves Christian. 72% consider themselves Christian. But only 31% of that considered themselves practicing Christians. Which means that 41% of people in America that would call themselves Christians think they can be a Christian without doing anything. 
We are not flourishing in the works of God. Our church as a whole in America is not flourishing in the works of God. We're not prioritizing the works of God. And sadly, so many Americans have lost their heart for Jesus Christ. Christ has become a second and third and fourth and fifth love. And family and success and money have come into the place of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Many Christians care about their pets more than they care about their neighbor or the alien or the foreigner or the widow. Many Christians care about so many things before they care about Jesus Christ. When we lose our heart, we become someone else. We have lost the priority of the word. We've lost the works. We've lost our whole heart for Jesus Christ. The American church as a whole has lost its devotion to Jesus Christ. We have lost our devotion to Jesus Christ. And it's time for a reset. It is time now, 500 years after Martin Luther, for the new reformation, for the new change in the church of who we are. It's time for a reset. And here, brothers and sisters, is the good news that you and I, that Truth Lutheran Church, that we can be the reset. That we can be different from the Christian culture around us. That we can prioritize God's word. That we can flourish in the works of God. That we can love Jesus Christ with all of our hearts. We can be that church. We are changing. You are changing. You people, you are changing. I am changing. We are becoming something different than who we were in the past. We're becoming more faithful, more pleasing, more powerful in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we will be the reset. Hope you're ready for the reset. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we see our national church, the National Protestant American Church, going astray. We see a loss of love for our spouse, for our husband, Jesus Christ. We see such a low priority on your word in so many lives. We see people who are not flourishing in the works of God. And we don't want to be that church, Lord. We will be the church that is devoted to you, Lord. We will honor your word. We will walk in your ways. We will love you with all of our hearts, Jesus Christ. We give ourselves to you. And we're ready for the reset. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And be seated. And will you just keep playing like that, son, son? That'd be great. Thank you. Reset. I'm going to yell. forgot my microphone. Reset begins with you. Okay, it's got to begin with you, right? And there's those three ways that we talked about today. The first is prioritizing the Word of God. Is the Word of God prioritized in your life? Are you reading it on your own? Are you studying it? Are you looking things up? Are you present in church? Are you following along in your Bible? Is this word prioritized in your life? Is it your authority? Is it there? Reset starts with you in the Word of God. It starts with you in the works of God. Maybe there's someone in your environment. Uh, maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker. Um, someone in your in I don't know. Someone in your class for you that are in classes. Maybe there's someone that the Lord wants you to reach out to. Maybe there's some love, some kindness that you could do as an, as an act, a personal act to walk in the works of God. And finally, check your heart. Where's your heart at? What do you love? The love in your heart is witnessed, it's indicated by your time and your talents. Time and your talents. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your talents? Especially your free time. What do you do with your free time? What do you do in that? That will be a good indicator of your love. Check your heart. Where's my heart at? We prioritize the Word of God personally. We walk in God's works personally. We love Jesus Christ with all our hearts completely, personally, right? And reset starts with you. And it flows out. 
Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the door of the chapel, right? But shortly after Martin Luther began to speak out and began to reform, all these other different reformers popped up. In, in Switzerland and in Sweden and in other parts of Germany, these different people, they stood up because they took courage from Martin Luther. And they saw and they agreed like with, with what was going on. That there had to be a change. As you reset, as you change your life, as you prioritize God's word, do the works and love Christ, other people are going to see that. And they're going to see that something's real in you that isn't real in them. Other Christians. And you're going to inspire them to change. The reset starts with you. And it flows out to others. We're the agents of the Reformation. We're the reset. We're the reformers of the new generation. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for these men and women who love you, who are seeking you. I pray that you would help them to be the resetters if that's a word, Lord, to be the reformers. I pray that you would help us to change, help us to be agents of change in our culture, to call the church back to true devotion to you. This is our desire, Lord. We love you. We receive your mercy. We receive your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.